Hi there, everyone. Let's have a Bible class. What do you say? You can turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. And uh, uh, also, if you want to turn there now, you can. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Ephesians 4, we've been talking for weeks and weeks now about uh, uh, how do we live with all of this mysteries revealed unto us and the perfect word of God in our hands and, and, uh, and the whole ability uh, from the from the spirit of the Lord to understand the things that we read and see and so we want to know how do we do this what do we do next who do we do it with and how do we approach it and on and on and on so we've been talking about that for a long time now and we're not nearly started I'm telling you we're not nearly started but I want you to read with me in Ephesians chapter 4 last time we were talking about the evangelists the pastors and the teachers and I want to start right there again today because I need to cover things that I didn't cover last time. And, uh, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a moment. Read with me from verse 11. He's given gifts unto men according to verse 8. And he gave some apostles. We know who they were. There first there were the 12 apostles. And then there was Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles. And the uh, 12 apostles knew everything was coming from the Old Testament scriptures as promised. And Jesus Christ had revealed that unto them when he called it the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. And as such, they revealed those mysteries of the kingdom of heaven unto thousands. And the people like Saul, the blasphemer, who would, pay, would not pay any attention to it, he was left uh, out in the cold and could not go into that kingdom of heaven because he blasphemed the Holy Spirit. He could not be promised anything in the future because he blasphemed the Holy Spirit. But the Lord chose him to tell the Gentiles the rest of the mysteries of God. And he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 that he let a man account, and, uh, account him and his men with him as stewards of the mysteries of God and that they would be Look to be faithful. In other words, they were the Lord was going to look at them to see if they were faithful with that. And so he was, and he's getting it to the end here. And Ephesians is the last book that he wrote before writing 2 Timothy, which was the absolute last book. So then look in Ephesians 4 again. That were, those were the apostles. Now I know other men were named apostles, and that's because Paul led them to know, to know who the Lord was and what the Lord was putting out for them. And then it says, and some prophets, and the Bible is full of prophets, including all those apostles who were prophesying the things that should come yet to come, and then including the apostle Paul, who prophesied of such things as we know today as the rapture, and we know today as, as the uh, timing uh, upon which uh, the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation taught about the Antichrist coming, and many other prophecies that Paul said, uh, for instance, in the last days perilous times shall come, and and, um, and what all men are going to be doing to themselves in the last days. And that causes a lot of upheaval today because everyone wants to think, yes, that's today. And yet it is the signs of that which is coming yet today. It's, we're, we're getting the signs of it all the time. But the deal is, it's not today that prophecy is being fulfilled. Only the prophecy of the Apostle Paul about how things should be. So with all that said, then we've got the apostles and prophets, and there aren't any more of those in the world. In other words, everything that, that, the, that the Lord has said that is going to come to the earth has already been written down. If men stand up and try to be a prophet today, they're going to steal from the scripture and going to add something that the Lord didn't give them. Speculation, whatever you want to call it, but they add to what the Lord has not said. In other words, they, they say this, and the Lord says this, and the Lord showed me this, on and on. No, he didn't. He wrote it all down in a book, and it can't be missed. Anybody that picks up this book's got it in their hands. And I'm talking about a King James Bible. And not only that, anybody that picks up this King James Bible and studies it can see it. And they ought not to ever be fooled by somebody saying, the Lord told me, the Lord told me. <clears throat> if they're saying things that the Lord, that you can find in the scripture, then the Lord didn't tell them personally. He wrote it down in a book for them to get. And therefore, therefore, these apostles and prophets who put all this together for the Lord, then they produced the last three offices that are named here, and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Now, today I want to talk to you about pastors and teachers in a, in a light that I don't like to do. I don't like to talk about this. I don't like it at all. I really don't. 
and I'll tell you why. And not only does it uh, does it uh, bother me to 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 bring all this up, I have a great fear that I'm going to do something wrong here. I'm not kidding. I have a great fear of that. Now, here's the deal. I'm going to talk to you about how a pastor or teacher should perform his ministry. I'm not talking to you about how he goes out and preaches and teaches and whether he hoops and hollers and jumps all over the place or whether he just reads the scripture rather monotone and never changes anything about his experience. I'm not talking about that kind of thing. I mean, if those guys would just sit still, I'd tell them how to do it, right? But no, I, I'm, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm going to talk to you about what the Bible, how the Bible describes how their ministry should be unfolded before the public. And you might already guess why that makes me nervous. What if I get so good at telling this the way I see it that everybody thinks I'm right? Well, they might ask me to write a textbook on the issue. I might be drawn into some great seminary attitude somewhere. Come on, folks. This is this everybody that picks up the word of God and desires to tell somebody about it is going to stand in judgment before the Lord all by himself. Jerry's not going to be hanging around, standing there with him, saying, oh, I told him that. I told him that. No, no, no. I will stand before the Lord in judgment, and so will anybody who picks up the book to teach it. So there's things that you who pick up the Bible and want to teach and preach, there are things here that you need to understand. But there's an even bigger thing that the congregation, all the rest of you folks, there's a, it's a bigger thing for you to understand than probably you even imagined. I'm telling you the truth. It's a big thing. So we're going to talk about it. Okay? Now, in Ephesians chapter 4, after he says, and he gave some evangelists and some pastors and teachers, verse 12, it says, for the perfecting of the saints. So then I got a situation in my hands here. What we want is how. How to perfect, I'll underline that, how do I perfect the saints, how can the gifts given unto men there perfect the saints, it didn't say make them as good as you can, it said perfect them for the perfecting of the saints, is that a big call? Yes, a big call. Is that because all you saints out there ain't, ain't near perfect? Yeah, it is. But you must understand, the Lord called also imperfect men to do this job. Well, then his instructions need to be clear. And bless your soul, they are. The perfecting of the saints comes about by the manner in which a ministry is performed. Let me say that again. The perfecting of the saints comes about due to the ministry, how the ministry is performed before them. I can already see people writing down notes saying, I'm going to check him on that, but I'm going to get him on that. And he's used the word he shouldn't use. Probably did. Let's just see what the scripture says about all this stuff I'm talking about, okay? Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And when you get there, we're going to be there for a while, but in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 4 is where that verse is I tried to quote while I'm going to think I misquoted it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 says, Let a man so account of us, and that would be Paul and Sosthenes, and he's also mentioned Apollos and so forth. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Now, he goes on there to say other things about that subject in that, in that chapter, and we may or may not use some of those things. But I want you to look down chapter 9. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, there are some things that most people miss here. And the reason they miss them is because the emphasis is on something else. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse... Um, 17, anybody that's a dispensationalist uses this verse. But I want you to notice that, that there are 27 verses in this chapter. And there's not one of them, not one of them, are you saying, not one of them 
that should be removed or turned away or looked at in a different light. You want to know how to perfect the saints? Pay attention. Back to verse 1. Now there are some things because of the uh, Paul being the apostle of the Gentiles. There are some things in Paul's writing that are specifically his, and several things in this chapter are specifically his, and couldn't not perfectly be applied to someone else. But about the same time he does that about himself, he puts everyone following him in this same category. Oh, yeah. So that it is applicable to them. Verse 1. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? If thou, I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you, for the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. Now, before we go any further, take out the fact here that Paul's referring to himself as an apostle, and look at him referring himself to those whom we should follow, as in that 1 Corinthians chapter 4 passage, be ye followers of me, even as I am of Christ. Or if we're in chapter 11, verse 1, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. I think I misquoted the chapter 4 says, be ye followers of me. Chapter 11, verse 1 says, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now, here's the thing. Do you think preachers ought to follow Paul? Come on, answer me. Do you think preachers ought to follow Paul? Should pastors and teachers follow Paul? Well, who else are they going to follow, folks? Okay, got that? Okay, then let's go back to this chapter and take out the apostleship of Paul, but use everything else about the teaching fashion in which he's doing here. Verse 1, he says, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Would you say that a preacher today, a pastor or a teacher, would you say they're free? Free, meaning they're not bound to anybody. A pastor or a teacher? Hey, come on. A pastor or a teacher? Are they free? Of course they're free. Paul was free. They're following Paul. They're teaching Paul's doctrine. Of course they're free. Of course they're free. Hmm. Then he says, verse 2, If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you, for the seal, S-E-A-L, seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. Now, this seal has everything to do with being a uh, the seal of mine apostleship, and, and so I'm, I'm making evangelists, pastors, and teachers to have the seal of their ministry. Not their, uh, They're not apostles, but the seal of their ministry. What seals up their ministry? It is the confirmation and the proven fact, I go there to teach, I was there 50 minutes, and this 490 people were right there, or 12, or 8, 6 maybe, whoever, whoever. Do I have a seal for my work in the Lord, my ministry? Yes, I do. Who is my seal? The people that I teach the Word of God to. Am I bound unto them? No. Nope. I'm free. Remember that? Free. But there is another aspect of that. You see, here comes a man, and he comes into your town, and he says to you, says, I'd like to teach a Bible class, and I heard that you believe in rightly dividing. Would you come to my class? And you say, well, yes, sir, I'd like to hear you preach. And so he says, okay, we're going to start this class on Monday night, 7 o'clock, and uh, could I count on you being there? You say, yes, sir, I'll be there. And so you go. And he teaches. And it's a good class. And he says, would you like to have a class next Monday night? And you and whoever else is this? Says, sure, yeah, that's a great idea. Boom, seven, eight weeks go past. Somebody says, Oh, we've got a tremendous Bible class going here. You need to come down and visit our Bible. And all of a sudden, other people start coming. And you go from three to four to five to 21 or whatever. Pretty soon, somebody's going to get the idea. We ought to be meeting on Sunday morning. That's when people go to church. We need to get the people going to church to come to hear our preacher. And the preacher says, that's a great idea. Well, I'll go out and look for me a place. And all of a sudden, somebody wants to form a committee. Don't ever 
do that. Never form a committee. Never build an organization where God did not build an organization and he never, God never put together an organization in his Bible. This is the church, the body of Christ. Come on now. This is not an organization. It is not a, a, a denomination. It is not a formality of a legal organization. And if a grace church, if a grace, grace believing church decides they should be a 501c3 according to the horrible United States government that as it is, and they choose to put themselves under 501c3 uh, regulations, then bless your soul, they get exactly what they deserve. And they shouldn't have done it. You got no business belonging to the government. You got no business belonging to a church. You got no business being part of an organization. You're a part of the body of Christ, for crying out loud. And that should be clear to you, should be open unto you. You're part of the body of Christ. Yes. Yes. Part of the body of Christ. So he says, You are the seal of mine apostleship. So the guy says, well, yeah, we're getting a pretty good crowd here, but uh, I, I, I don't see any reason to um, have anything but a Bible class. Just a little bit bigger. I'll get a, go get a bigger room. I'll go get a bigger, or I have a building. I got a building over. I can rent this building over here. I think I believe we'll just do that. Pretty soon, somebody's going to say, well, is this going to be a church or is this going to be a Bible class? Well, it is a church for crying out loud. Church is a member, is a group of People who have been called out together. Nothing, <laughs> nothing about that implies organization. Oh, doing things decently and in order? Absolutely. But an organization? No, it doesn't imply that. Don't you let somebody tell you that it does, because it doesn't. Now, in the passage, he goes on this way. Verse 3. My answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? Or I only and Barnabas, have not we power to forbear working? Well, that raises some interesting questions there. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? He's talking about power. What's he talking about? Is he talking about the Spirit of the Lord? Yes, he is. He is talking about the Spirit of the Lord. The power to eat and to drink, the power to lead about a, wife, a sister, a wife, and, uh, uh, and so forth, or the power to forbear working. He does. This man of God, he comes in, he teaches Bible class, you attend, others attend, pretty soon more attend. Got it, got it, on and on. Whose Bible class is that? You say, it's ours. It's yours to attend. He didn't charge you a ticket fee. He just asked you if you wanted to come. It's the Bible teacher's class. Some of you may not like that, but you're wrong. You know why I know that? Because of the word master. James, as well as the Lord himself, as well as Paul, said, the Lord Jesus Christ is our master. And James even went on to say, be not many masters in what you're doing, in other words, knowing that of the Lord you receive the greater condemnation. Now, if you want to be the master over your class, then I suggest you start a class. A man one time asked a, a fellow that was holding a Bible conference, he said, hey, why don't you do so-and-so and so-and-so? And the -so? man holding the Bible conference said, would you like to do that at a Bible conference? And he said, I sure would. And he said, well, why don't you go have a Bible conference? Was he being a smart aleck? Somewhat. Did he mean it? Absolutely. It isn't that preachers don't like suggestions or pastors, or, or Bible teachers, they, they all like suggestions. They, they, in fact, they look for them all the time. 
But bless your soul, there's only one person. The Lord's going to hold accountable for that. Only one is the Lord going to hold accountable. And once again, I realize that some of you may not like what I'm saying, but it doesn't matter to me. I want you to notice how this chapter unfolds and who's in charge. Keep reading. Verse 7. Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth the vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt this is written. And the hour in the passage is not the congregation, but the ones he's writing to is the congregation. For our sakes, no doubt this is written, middle of verse 10, that he that should that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. Verse 11. Now don't get mad at me. I did not write this. If we have sown unto you, the, pe the preacher or apostle in this case, but the preacher and the teacher, uh, pastor and, and teacher, if he has sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if he shall reap your carnal things? If others be partakers of this power over you, hey, how many times you've been to a ball game, walked in without get buying a ticket? How many times you've been to a movie house, walked in without buying a ticket? How about a concert, walk in without buying a ticket? So you say, we don't sell tickets, it's free. Um, he's free. The pastor and the teacher, remember verse one? He's free. Notice verse 12, verse 11 again. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, it is, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power. Remember, he said, Do you think I don't have the power? I don't have, the, of course I got the power. But notice he says, Nevertheless, we have not used this power but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. I don't criticize people who do this in a way other than me, but just so that you know, from about the second year that I was pastoring a church, which was uh, would have been about 1980, from that year, I never took up a collection. Now, I did take up an offering a few times was when it was designatedly going to someone else, like someone in trouble, someone who had a terrible tragedy in their home or something like that. We took up a lot of special offerings like that and that sort of thing. And for a long time, we took up an offering and passed a plate around for that. But after several years of doing that, we never had to do that again. People just brought it and gave it. This is for this. This is for this. this for... So we never did it. And I'll tell you something else. When uh, I was pastoring the church where I decided to stop taking up an offering, um, that it, no one no one got upset at that. But here's what happened: that was in a church that had, I did not own that building, and the church was already there when I went there, and so there were church money needs, and um, I stopped them from giving me a salary. I didn't like the idea of getting a salary. And yet people wanted to give me money, which I said, thank you, praise the Lord for. And they also wanted to give money to the church. So what, I got up on Sunday and I said, we've got two plates sitting back there. Mark one of those plates for the church ministry, the church building ministry, and the other one, Jerry's ministry. Okay? They all agreed. And so from then on, I only went to the one plate, looked what was there, took it, said, thank you, praise the Lord. Now, if you want to know some of the miraculous things that happened there, I can tell you at another time. I'm not taking the time to do that now. But a man got mad, and you know what he said? 
He said, you just want all the money. I said, well, you be sure and not give me any. What do you think ought to go to the work of the Lord? Why don't you put it in the building plate? He never did come back to church. He thought I wanted all the money. If he'd have ever known the situation, <laughs> never mind. Listen, here's the deal. Paul said, we have not used this power. He didn't say we didn't have the power. He said, we've not used this power. Are we supposed to follow Paul? Absolutely. Should a preacher beg for money? Absolutely not. Should he tell the crowd what he needs? No. Why don't he tell his Lord and Master what he needs? That's the way it should be. That's the implication so long here. Who does Paul work for here? He works unto the Lord through the people that he makes himself a servant to. If you make yourself a servant to someone, you got any say so about what money they should give you? Nope. Well, the principle holds straight through the line. The very idea that a preacher should say, well, uh, yeah, I, I would, I would kind of like to be your pastor, and I think I ought to have a salary of this much money. Got a house I can live in? And on and on it goes. A preacher that should do that would do that should never be hired by anyone. Should the people be generous with him? Yes, according to the way they're taught. I'll get there in a moment. But should he use the power? No, he should not use it. He's supposed to be following Paul, remember? He should not use the power. Verse 13. Oh, by the last part of verse 12. He says, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Bear in mind that there's only one reason for any of this to go on, and that is the preaching of the gospel of Christ. Only one reason, and it's the preaching of the gospel of Christ. I don't give a flip how many rightly dividing classes you have. It's all about preaching the gospel of Christ, how that Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised for our justification. If we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll be saved. And everybody you taught, tell that to, you have exercised a power over them because the power of God is in that gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Part of Romans 1 16. Keep reading. Uh, verse uh, 13 now. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? He's referring to the, his Jewish roots and the people, mainly the people of, of Corinth's Jewish roots. He found them in a synagogue. Uh, minister about things. Uh, 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 those who minister about things uh, live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. Even so, if the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. I want you to ask, answer this question, not to me. Answer this question to yourself. If they who have preached unto you the gospel of Christ, faithfully and applicably, so that you understand it well enough that you can speak to other people, do you believe they are living by the gospel? It says, even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. If they're living of the gospel, you suppose someone's giving to them? If they're living of the gospel, do you suppose anyone is giving to them? And I would hope that you can see that and would you say yes to it. Well, then let's look at some scripture. Back up again to the first, a little earlier in the passage, and notice this. Verse 9, for it is written in the law of Moses, thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen, or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, he says, no doubt. Look, if you will, in 1 Timothy, hold on to 1 Corinthians 9, and look in 1 Timothy, First Timothy chapter 5, and notice this. And by the way, I want to remind you, a man that is a pastor or a teacher is the true definition of the word bishop in your Bible. And bishop 
and, uh, and to the church, an elder have the same application of rules according to Titus chapter 1. Titus 1 shows a bishop and an elder under the same tutelage, the same leadership, the same requirements, and so forth. Notice here 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine, for the scripture saith, they shall, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. That's under the law. And the laborer is worthy of his reward. Please notice it says reward. Incidentally, under the kingdom of heaven doctrine, the Lord Jesus Christ mentioned this, and he said the laborer is worthy of his hire. But Paul said the word reward. Is he worth his reward? Then should you have a committee that wonders how much money he got? He set the plate by the back door of the Bible class, and people get to putting five dollars in there or three dollars in there, or they put up something in paper and fold it up. You ever wonder what it is? Why? What do you care if it's forty thousand uh, dollars? That's never happened. By the way. What do you care if it's 500? What if you care if it's a thousand? What if you care if it's enough for the whole class? Should the whole class just put their hands back in their pockets? Huh. Hold on to 1 Corinthians 9 and look in Galatians chapter 6. Galatians 6. In Galatians 6, verse 6. You know, if you want to take any verses seriously about this, take these. Verse 6, Galatians 6, 6. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting, and let us not be weary in well-doing. Well, then verse 6 and 7, with, an, with the example of verse 8, shows the well-doing having to do with communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Well, what sort of good things? Well, based in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, it's things that will help this man to have hope. Look at verse 10. Saith he it, the law about the ox. Saith he it altogether for our sakes. For our sakes, no doubt this is written, that he that ploweth, the guy doing the hard work, should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth, which is the reaping, in hope should be partaker of his hope. Well, Shall he charge you? Shall he say, well, it's $50 a first hour. And if I do a second hour tonight, it's $35. Give you a break there. No. He should get what is laid upon the hearts of the intent attendees, those who are being communicated unto, what's on their hearts to give. Second most important passage about this. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And this is all about Paul taking up an offering for other people. So you'll excuse me for using this, but the doctrine is very clear. Because the doctrine is not about who you give the money to. It's about how come it says what it says about those who will give. How come it says this? Because this is true. I'll never forget a breakfast morning. Uh, before I moved to Texas, we had Brother E.C. Moore and myself and Brother Steve Gottberg we taught a Bible conference out there. The three of us did it. And on Sunday morning, we could not get into the room at a normal time. We had to wait. And so we all met at a restaurant. And uh, at the restaurant, a man who wound up being in our assembly for the whole 27 years we was there, uh, he asked Brother Moore, um, do you teach tithing? And Brother Moore said, um, do you mean, do I teach that every family should give a tenth of what they have under the ministry? 
And he says, well, yeah. Brother Moore says, no. Are you going to ask me the second question? And the man smiled and said, should they? Brother Moore said, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. So I got you there. Let's read the passage. We'll start in verse 6. You just read this in another passage. Remember Galatians 6? But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he that which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Now, before I go on, I want you to notice, verse 7 says, Every man, according to as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. And I tell you what, that does not say every family. It doesn't even say every married couple, ladies and gentlemen. It says every man. Meaning an individual. I don't think it's got anything to do with gender. I think it's every person. It's every, in every individual man. You see, here's the thing. Every man, according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give. So let him give. In other words, who, who, who is the let there? The individual is. So let him give. He gives according to that which he purposes in his heart, or she. Notice the next phrase, not grudgingly. Well, I'm going to pay the preacher. You know. I don't like what he does, but if you don't like what he does, don't go to his class. You want to get back at him? <laughs> he says, and then he says, or of necessity. I'll tell you why you don't have to give thinking there's a necessity. I really mean this, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart. If nobody had ever given me a penny, I don't believe I would have ever quit preaching. If I'd have never got a penny, I would not have quit. So there's no necessity. And a lot of people right now, I know, oh, good, I'm glad it's not a necessity. Of course you are. But how about the first half? Every man according as he purposeth in his heart. And remember, the previous verse, he that sows sparingly reaps how? Sparingly. He that soweth bountifully reaps how? Bountifully. You say, well, I want to see the reaping. You want to see the reaping first? Then you got seed and groundbreaking backwards. First you sow. First you get there. In other words, you get the dirt right. You see your need. You know, when a, when a farmer plows, uh, the old turning plow, they don't do it anymore, or very little of it, but the old turning plow days, when you turn that dirt over, you got nothing. You might have had something up there on top that wasn't worth much, but you had something, but you turned it over. You ain't got nothing. Then you disc it down, get it smooth, and you put seeds in it. And then you reap a crop. There's no receiving bountifully if there's been no sowing bountifully. Then he says, again, he says, so let him give according to what's in your heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loved the cheerful giver. You know, it never mattered to me what someone gave. And I will never forget this as long as I live. I hope I don't. I plan on working to not forget this. A good man, a good man yet today, came to our Bible class for a long time in one of the cities in Texas, and he got his mother to come. And his mother, she loved her home church. And I believe she saw quite a bit of the truth, but she loved, she knew all those people, and she was elderly. She just loved her home church. And she sent word by her son that she enjoyed the preaching and the teaching, but that she was going to go to her home church. And then he had handed me a check written by her. And he did this for several weeks. I don't know how many. And sometimes it would be for $2. $3. Two the next week. Three the next week. I don't believe it was ever over five. 
To me, it was like getting two hundred dollars, folks. Oh I, no, not that I didn't go out and try to spend it like that, but the the knowing from the heart where that came from from the heart. Oh, how wonderful that was to get that. I look forward to him walking in the door partly because I wanted to see what his mother gave me. You say, you sound pretty carnal to me. I say, you got me. All over the place, you got me. You better believe it. Now, here's the thing. I got to look at the clock. Okay. Now, here's the thing. The next verse is the most important one. I believe. A man told me one time that he, that he had taken, uh, he, he put all of his ministry based upon this promise of verse 8. And I praise the Lord for his ministry to this day. But here's the thing. This verse, verse 8, is really not written to the preacher. Oh, it's applicable to the preacher, for sure. But notice it says, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you. That be the one in verse 6 and 7 that he's telling them how to give. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Notice there's a parenthesis. Pick it up down in verse 11. Being enriched in everything to all bountifulness. Why? Because you gave bountifully. That's why. Uh, which causeth through, uh, through us thanksgiving to God. If Paul was the recipient of someone he knew was giving bountifully, he praised the Lord and th through great thanksgiving unto the Lord, he would honor the gift given by thanking God for it. When I first started preaching, someone handed me some money, and I asked Brother Morrison, what do you say when somebody hands you money? And he said, for preaching? And I said, yeah. And he said, say thank you. He said, it might help them if you say, praise the Lord. Thank you very much. And I tried to practice that. Say, thank you. And say, praise the Lord. You know why? I didn't write this book. If I show you something out of this book, it's because the Lord has allowed me to see what it says. The Lord made me a couple of Trafalgar High School English teachers and made me see how I can understand this. You see what I mean? Look at that verse again. God is able to make all grace abound toward you, the giver. That you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound unto every good work. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, in case you're wondering why, I feel so strongly adamant about this. It's this. Turn over just a page to the right there, probably after 2 Corinthians 9. I want you to look in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1 says, Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. In other words, put up with what I'm fixing to say here, because what I'm fixing to say is about you. And it's how you and I are before the Lord. It's, a, it's about how we are there before the Lord, you and I. Me being the preacher, teacher, pastor, whatever uh, title uh, that would apply to what I'm doing here. You being the hearer, the listener. Notice this. When he said, uh, uh, bear with, indeed bear with me, he says, verse 2, 4. Here's the reason why he's calling on you to bear with him. He says, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. What does Paul mean, godly jealousy? Well, the Lord, God Almighty, is jealous for his people. Look up jealous in the Old Testament. You'll see what I mean. But now here's the thing. We always thought of jealousy as that. Is jealousy that green monster? Is that, I forget which one's the green monster. I think it's jealousy. But here's the thing jealous over you with godly jealousy has everything to do with how much Paul cared for people. And if you go over in this chapter further and you start seeing what Paul suffered, he says in verse 19, 
For you suffer fools gladly, seeing ye yourselves are wise. For you suffer if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face. I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak. Howbeit, whereinsoever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Now Paul's asserting himself here, and he's making, he's making us to see that it's his folly, and he's made us to see that he speaks uh, foolishly, and yet the Lord left it all together right here in your Bible. Which means it's more of the Lord than Paul knew when he was saying it, when he was writing it down. So start with verse 22 now. He says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. I had a Baptist preacher ask me one time who I thought, who he thought I, who I thought I was to try to teach somebody something that went to his church. I said, I think I'm a lot like you. And he said, well, in what way? And I said, well, I've got a Bible and it's God's word and I can read it and I can get it in front of people and yell it at them just like you do. And they're free to read uh, what you say is true and they're free to read what I say is true and they're free to make up their own mind, aren't they? He didn't want to continue the thought. He says, are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Verse 23, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more. You know why he said I am more? Because he knew that what he was was a minister of the church, the body of Christ. Keep reading. He goes into this now, and it's horrible to listen to. But there's a reason why I want you to listen to it. Hang in there. He says, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. I don't even know how to figure that one out. He says, of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. The law says it can't go over 40, so they all went 39. Uh, verse uh, 25, thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. We don't know about those. Oh, no, we know about the one later. We don't know about the first three. Um, a night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness. <laughs> it's made me tired reading this. And painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Now watch this. Beside those things which are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. A man that pastors and teachers might be going someplace over here for five or six years, and then he goes over here for 12 years, and he goes over here for 20-something or whatever. He always knows who is in his ministry. He knows who they are. You know, we've gone into this electronic age, and we do all this by uh, the graciousness of Facebook and the graciousness of uh, Zoom, although they... Uh, in their commercial, they they charge. Well, Facebook has ads all over the place. You know what I mean. But there's a graciousness to this. So far, they haven't stopped us from preaching the gospel of Christ, and they let us go on. And even though you know we pay some money to do it in certain ways, but nevertheless, we've got this privilege to do it. And so when Paul says the care of all the churches, he knew where he had been, and he knew he saw. And we sometimes don't know all of you who are watching or listening or whatever. We don't know. But we do know what we're saying. Sometimes when I go back and watch something that I previously recorded and put out over the magnificent airwaves to all 7 billion people, sometimes I want to cringe. But most times I know, I know. I know I didn't do it perfectly. And I know I didn't get it across perfectly. Turn to Colossians chapter 1. And one of the reasons I know that it's not done perfectly every time I do it 
is because of me. I'm just me. I'm not good. I'm not better. I'm not best. I'm not any of those categories. I stand here and I do whatever is before me to do for the express purpose of making the gospel of Christ known. And sometimes I realize that probably the one, two, five, or 12 people who might hear this are probably already saved. I just want you to know the best you possibly can from the best I possibly can how to speak the words of the gospel of Christ. We're going back to 1 Corinthians 9 in a moment, and I hope, you, hope that's what you can see. But I want you to notice here in Colossians chapter 1, when he talks about <clears throat> it was given unto him to fulfill the word of God in verse 25, he says, here's what, here's what it was, and here's why it was. He says, it was a dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Now, verse 26, even the mystery which had been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom. I want you to be sure you understand that says teaching every man in all wisdom. And then it goes on that we may present every man <coughs> perfect in Christ Jesus. What's this say? How to perfect the saints. We teach the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in us, the hope of glory. And we teach it along with all the wisdom of God we can find. Not only all the wisdom of God, but all the wisdom of God as is manifest in the power of God unto salvation. Why did Christ go to that cross? How did he go to the cross? And for what purpose did he come forth from there after crying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? For me, folks, is for you. He came forth for us, and he gave it to the Apostle Paul, and he said, get on with it and tell them, and tell those guys that follow you to do it the same way you do it. Now go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We'll pick up in verse 16. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. In other words, of himself, it's not about him. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, what was unto me if I preach not the gospel? And I've learned that sometimes that I get big headed and charge off in a direction that I shouldn't go. And I always learn that. It's about the gospel, Jerry. It's not about you. It's not about what you think. not how much you know. It's about the gospel of Christ. That simple 28-word passage. How the Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried, was raised again the third day according to the scriptures. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's about that. Keep reading. What is my reward then? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, verse 17. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward, not a higher, a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. Notice all that power he mentioned there a while ago. He doesn't use that. And he doesn't give us the, we who are doing this today, he doesn't give us the freedom to do that. Walking down the street one day with a friend of mine in Birmingham, Alabama. He said, see that house up there where the road runs into a T and that big, beautiful home there? I said, yeah. He said, if you went into a denominational church and got yourself a job in a big church as an assistant pastor, that could be your house. And I said, what makes you think that? And he said, because that's who lives there, the assistant pastor of a big church. You know what that told me? Told me he made a lot of money. Told me he made a lot of money. Why? Because he couldn't afford that house if he didn't. We was in a big neighborhood, a big house, in a big spot on top of a hill. Well, that's not what we do. What is my reward then? Verse 18. 
Verily, when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. Now, if I've talked all of you into giving and you send me a check this week, I'll say thank you, praise the Lord. If all of you are mad at me and you never come back and you never give me a, a check, I will say praise the Lord for the opportunity to get up next Sunday and do it again. And again and again and again and again until there's no breath left. How's 2021 going to be for you? It's going to be about like 2020 for me. I'm going to preach the gospel of Christ every chance I get. Two, three, four times a week, whatever it is. Every day when I talk to people. <coughs> Notice now, he says in verse 19. For though I be free from all men. There's the way a preacher should always be. Obligations, they should between, be between him and the Lord. If I was a preacher today and someone wanted me to take a salary, I'd say no, just like I did in 1981. If someone said, why don't you sign a work contract, I'd say no. Never had one. Don't believe in them. I believe if you do the work, you stay. If you don't do the work, you get fired. This is a simple life, folks. Why in the world we want to complicate it? We don't need to complicate it. We need to do it the way the Lord ordained it. Notice he says here, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. Now again, right here is where Paul, he called go unto the Jews. I became Jew. All of that stuff, he says, we can't do that. We're not like that. We're not apostles, and we're not doing what Paul was doing. We, we have Paul's words to use that he got from the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Lord Jesus Christ tells us in the final chapter, preach the word, brother. He says, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, which can only come, by the way, all long suffering and doctrine can only come from the spirit that God gives man when he picks up this King James Bible and begins to receive it, as it says it, where it says it, directly from the Lord. So now this is Paul. Paul wrote the way the Lord wanted him to. Notice then, go down to skip down to verse 23. The things of verse nine, uh, 19, free from all men, made myself servant unto all, and that I might gain the more, verse 23 says, and this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. With you. So how are you going to be a partaker with me? You get people come to the Bible class, I'll preach the gospel to them. You can confirm it because you can show them to the scripture. You can take them to the scripture. I can be an evangelist to the people you bring to the Bible class. If you want me to talk to them, you just bring them over and sit down with me. We'll be glad to talk and we can show them the Bible. We talk about what God says, not what we say. What God says. Now I want you to go back to 2 Corinthians uh, now chapter 11 one more time and then I'll be done. This will be it. I promise uh, this is the only time I will bring up the idea of giving to a ministry. Uh, I already, let me just recap here. I did, I did this for three reasons. For one, it is for the understanding that the ministry is the gospel, the preaching of the gospel of Christ, no matter who does it nor when. It is a, the ministry is the preaching of the gospel of Christ as the power of God unto salvation. Number two, people who have the power of God unto salvation, explain to them, preach to them, and set it apart and rightly divided. Those people should have the obligation in their heart and mind, not in the, in the rules and regulations, but in their heart and mind should come the idea, if I give sparingly, I ain't going to see much result. But if I give bountifully to this man who's doing this work, then someday somebody, because of me, is going to hear the gospel of Christ, and the Lord's going to reward me. And it's a reward, not a hire. And then the third thing is right here. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He describes some problems. And he says basically here, In verse um, about all these people, and he calls them false apostles and deceitful workers and transforming themselves into the ministers of or the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, verse 14 says, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. You know, if a good grace preacher ain't never going to look to you like an angel of light. Verse, verse 15, here we go. Therefore, 
it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their, to their works. That shouldn't surprise you. If their end is according to their works, Romans chapter 16 says their God is their belly. He says, I say again, let no man think me a fool. If otherwise yet a fool receive me, that I may boast myself a little. That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly in this confidence of boasting. Seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. You see, here's my point about that. We all, all preachers, all evangelists, all pastors, and all teachers are set for the perfecting of the saints. But we are all foolishly fleshly. We will make errors. Some of them we'll make are bad. Some of them don't matter. Some of them are little things and somebody will make a mountain out of it. And some of them are mountains and somebody will just bowl it over and you just keep going. These things will happen. A man starts to preach. He's 30 years old or whatever. He starts out to preach and uh, he's, got, he's had a pretty good teacher and he knows about rightly dividing. And the first thing you know, he's got himself in a mess. He's trying to figure out what to do next. He'll figure it out. The deal is stay in the word. And we, the rest of us watching that young man, we support him. We support him. If he's our teacher, we support him every way we can. If he's a student, we support him every way we can. And many times, the man who taught me how to study this Bible would walk up to me and my pockets would be empty. And he would stick something in my shirt pocket. And I'd pull it out later and it'd be 520s or 250s. Did he know I was broke? No. Did I tell him? No. What did he know? He knew how tough it was. He knew how hard it was. He knew how difficult it was to say, I'm not going to do anything but preach the gospel of Christ. I'm not going to do anything but, but teach Bible classes and go where I'm allowed to go teach. Many things come along. When a man does that, many things come along from very interesting locations that makes it possible for him to do it. It isn't always the people sitting in front of him that is giving him the money. I can tell you many, many stories along those lines. I have prayed for specific amounts of money and got them. I've prayed for it, gone to get it from the post office, absolutely sure it was there, and it wasn't there, but before I got out of the parking lot of the, of the post office, someone handed it to me. And on and on and on, folks. The Lord handles this. You who think you might be a teacher and a preacher, don't worry about a thing. Remember the pattern of praying in Philippians chapter 4 and get on with it. The Lord will honor what you do when you handle his word correctly and you preach a manner of rightly dividing the word of truth that brings everyone to the gospel of their salvation. I thank you all for being here tonight. We'll pick up right there next week and go on about the, uh, the full grown man, I guess is what we'll talk about next. Bye, everybody.